Okay. Welcome everybody to the colorectal webinar series module four. We have a lot of participants already and probably they're coming even more. Um, this is a series we started in June this year and will consist of 11 um, modules. As you can see, we have a nice program for you. We had already basic of laparoscopic colorectal surgery. We went down with left colon and sigmoid surgery, went to right colon. And today we will cover special situations in laparoscopic colonic surgery. For all of you who have not been here for the first three modules, all these modules are recorded and you will be informed with a link on YouTube to have a look also on the modules which were before. You will also get an invitation for the next module in uh, September, which is principles of ICG and fluorescent imaging, and we will have in another week. So we go ahead for today's program, and it's, it's an honor again to have a distinguished panel with us. So I'm running this webinar series together with Colin Sitches from Netherlands and normally also Andreas Chamier. And we invite some special guests in the panel. And this time we will have Friedrich Herbst from Vienna, one of the very famous laparoscopic colorectal surgeons there. And also from Poland, this time we have Michael Bejewald with us. And he will also be uh, presenting a case and interesting details for laparoscopic colorectal surgery. Okay, so then we will proceed to the first lecture about the flexor mobilization, because this is uh, mainly needed in laparoscopic colorectal surgeons, so we focus on that in a special topic, and Colin Sieges from Netherlands will give his lecture about that. Well, actually, the part of this lecture is a little bit of a repetition of my previous lectures on left colectomy and on right colectomy, because, of course, that's also a part of those procedures. But I think it's good to repeat it a little bit, because the next speakers will talk to you about complex procedures, uh, like total colectomy, like uh, uh, transverse resection, and the last speaker will even talk to you about uh, what to do if flexor mobilization isn't enough anymore. So it's good to start with the basis. And also we have some new drawings made by the same artists who also made the drawings for uh, the TTME app. Most of you know this is a project of the iLab Surgery Foundation and currently we're working with Joop Noll, who's the in initiator of the ILAP Surgery Foundation on some new chapters for this uh, app. So you will we'll see this in the near future. So this is how in traditional open surgery flexion mobilization uh, what was started. Uh, with the left hand, the, 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 the ball was pulled to medial and then with the right hand, the, 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 the adhesions between the ball and the abdominal wall were cut but this was often quite difficult, specifically obese patients. It was difficult to get your, your surgical field in, into vision, and there was often a lot of pulling and tearing, and sometimes even damaging of the spleen with bleeding. So the laparoscopic approach is eminently ideal for the mobilization of the splenic flexure. And in the previous lecture on left colectomy, I already told, to, to, uh, told you that mobilization of the splenic flexor all circles around the different ways to enter the lesser sac. And for the mobilization of the splenic flexor, all the adhesion between the omentum, between the transverse colon, the mesentery of the transverse colon, the descending colon, the pancreas, the retroperitoneum, and the lateral bowel wall, all have to be cut to get a complete mobilization of the splenic flexor. And the first step, of course, which you have to do is to getting your your surgical reference points into your operative field. And for this procedure, your surgical reference point is trige ligament and the inferior mesenteric vein. So you have to get the small bowel out of your way. And the easiest way to do that is to use gravity. So you have to tilt the patient all the way to the right so the small bowel gets out of your way. And of course, you have to fixate the patient to the operating table quite firmly for that uh, to make sure that your patient doesn't fall off the operating table. And as soon as you have your reference points in your, uh, in your operative field, you can start with the procedure. And the first step is to create a tunnel or a plane behind the mesentery of the transverse and the descending colon and the rotas fascia. So you do this by lifting up the inferior mesenteric vein and making a tunnel over the rotas fascia and continue this as lateral as possible. 
because this will benefit you at the, la at the end of the procedure. Of course, your next step is to cut the vein. Uh, do this at the border of the pancreas because this will make sure that you have enough length for reanastomosis at the end. But this is also your border for your lymphadenectomy. So make sure that you remove all the vein till the border of the, the pancreas. And the next step is the first uh, time you want to enter the lesser sac. And a lot of surgeons do this through the same opening of where they already made the tunnel over Gerardus fascia and then open the, 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 the plane over the pancreas. But this is actually quite difficult sometimes because if you follow Gerardus fascia, the, mo the, the logical plane is that you enter or, your, or you go beneath the pancreas. The, the, the anatomic plane can, brings you there. So sometimes, specifically, if you're not really experienced, you can get into problems of bleeding or damaging the pancreas. So I prefer to do it with another approach. I prefer to make a, a window in the mesentery of the transverse colon to, for that being the first way or first time to enter the lesser sac. And if you enter the transverse colon or the mesentery of the transverse colon and enter the lesser sac, of course you have to realize or consider the vascularization. But in the majority of patients, the vascularization is like here in the left lower part, but you only have to consider the middle colic artery and there isn't that much more you have to consider. Sometimes there is a, an, an, an extra anatomic variant and of course you have to, to if you see that, you have, to make, you have to look whether or not making an opening in the mesentery is uh, the, uh, the best way, but in the majority of patients you can make, you can do this and then it's actually quite easy to mobilize the flexure from medial. You just put tension on both windows and work from medial to lateral over the pancreas. And you can clearly see what you do and you don't have the risk of, of getting below the pancreas and creating a bleeding. Of course, the next step is entering the lesser sac over the transverse colon. You lift up the momentum of the, tr of, of the transverse colon and then you enter the lesser sac you pull the transverse colon towards you and from medial to lateral, you open this plane and the last plane you want to enter is lateral and the adhesion between the descending colon and the abdominal wall. And if you've done enough dissection from medial, then you can pull the complete bowel to the medial. And if you can see Gerardus fascia and the tail of the pancreas then, then you know that you've mobilized the splenic flexure uh, completely. I will now show you in a video the different steps behind each other. Um, what you can see here is again lifting up the mesentery vein and creating a plane behind Tos fusion fascia, so in front of Gerardus fascia. And you continue this plane all the way to the, as lateral as possible. At the bottom of the field, you see the ureter. So if you think that you can't damage the ureter this high up, I think again, because it is possible. Then the next step is taking down the vein. You already see the border of the pancreas here. So try to do it really at the border of the pancreas to make sure that you do a complete lymphadenectomy. And I cut this with ligature. And then comes the step that I enter the lesser sac for the first time. You see that there's only the middle colic artery to consider and no anatomic variation. So I make the second opening. And then if you put tension on both openings, you can work from medial to lateral over the pancreas. And you can do this in a really controlled fashion. There's no risk that you go below or behind the pancreas. And again, you continue this as lateral as possible. So you don't have to do that much at the end of the procedure when you come from lateral. So lift both windows up and make sure that you have proper tension on your tissue. And this is the last step, the pancreatic tail. Again, as long as you can do dissection from medial to lateral, continue as far as possible as you can. 
So the next step is entering the lesser sac over the transverse column, pull the transverse column towards you and lift up the omentum. And then from medial to lateral, you open this plane. And then if you've done enough for medial, then you can just cut the last adhesions on the lateral side and the flexure is completely mobilized. You the last step, and you can pull the complete ball towards you. So the next video is to show you how easy it is to getting below or behind the pancreas. You again see the plane from medial to lateral behind the inferior mesenteric vein, and consider the tip of the, the stump of the, uh, of the inferior mesenteric vein, which we clipped, and this is the border of the pancreas. And then you can see that in this operation, we're already behind the pancreas. And sometimes it's really difficult to see the color difference between the tail of the pancreas and the mesentery of the transverse colon. But in this case, the tail is completely mobilized. And you can see that the correct plane is way up here. And as long as you don't make a bleeding or create a complication, it's not that bad to, to mobilize the, 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 the tail of the pancreas. But you can get into serious problems uh, if you uh, damage a vein this high up. So try to prevent uh, mobilizing the spleen this far. So the next uh, couple of minutes, I'm gonna talk to you about flexion mobilization of the hepatic flexure, uh, also already discussed during the right collecting. Um, a lot of surgeons do this uh, from above. So they do it over the colon transverse, transverse colon and just open the peritoneum and push everything down. I, to prefer, I prefer to make a tunnel from below. Uh, so every adhesions are already released. So I do it the same as in the right colectomy, the bottom to up right colectomy. So I follow the plane from below, uh, behind touch fusion fascia, and I create it all the way up to the transverse colon. And then, like I told you before, I cut the adhesions between the duodenum and the mesentery of the transverse colon, so it's completely freed from the duodenum and from the pancreas. So you have everything free, and if you have everything free, it's easy to mobilize the rest from lateral and from above the uh, transverse colon. So here's a brief video. So you get the small bowel out of the way, and you make a tunnel like in the right colectomy, but you leave the adhesions on the lateral side And you just pull it up and make the tunnel as far up as possible so you don't have to do that much from above. Just pull it up. And continue as far as possible. And this operation was actually for a right colectomy, so in this case, the vessels were cut, but if you only want to do the, the mobilization of the flexure, of course, you leave the vessels. But this, is, I think, is an important step. Open the fascia, so the mesentery is freed from the duodenum and from the pancreas. And if you free this, then it's actually quite relatively easy to do the last steps from above, and you completely mobilize the flexure. So at the end, you pull it medial, and you cut the last adhesions, and you freeze the complete flexure. So thank you very much. I'll give the word back to Walter. So I would go ahead with the transverse colon resections, and I hope you see my screen now. Um, as you are aware, we had the basic of laparoscopic colorectal surgery in module one. 
we had the left colon and sigmoid surgery in module two, and we had the right in colon in, in the module three. Now Colin explained to you the flexure mobilization. So if anyone put everything together, he could think, well, I can do the transverse colon resections anyway. So what can I add? And let me try to, to add something. So of course, the, the main point in, in colorectal surgery is a, a complete mesorectal excision if we talk about tumor and colonic cancer surgery. Uh, so this is, was published years ago and, and everybody should try to, to stay with that. You see, this was the big difference. If we do proper resection, that makes a big difference for the patient. And also the specimen should look very perfect if we had the resection pretty finished and we put the specimen out. So this is what we try to do. There are some golden rules of laparoscopy. I told you that's just a little bit to remember. Um, and also you should remember, especially for transverse colon resection, that strategic conversion is a safety and not um, a mobility. So if, if you use that and you need that, that's, that's pretty good. And we see that also in the laparoscopic uh, big trials which were done, we see there were the conversion rates. Now they are around 10 to 15% anyway, but when they started, they went up to nearly 30% of conversion rate. Uh, the, the, the thing is, in all these big trials, there were no transverse colon resections, but they were mainly excluded um, because obviously there is something difficult. If we talk about laparoscopy, the, the most difficult thing is also to find and stay in embryological planes. And you saw some brilliant videos from Colin. That's why I, I stepped back a little bit from showing you the same videos because he showed you a lot of things you will need also for the transverse colon resection with mobilization of uh, both lectures. And, and these were golden rules I showed you if you go to laparoscopic colorectal surgery, especially looking on toads or gerota fascia and stay in the right planes uh, and not try to cut them. So you should make no touch technique, of course, also for the transverse colon, not the tumor, uh, not the mesocolon, if possible, to the rupture the mesocolon. Um, you should use a swab and not disrupt the specimen during the operation. It should look the same in the end of the operation at its beginning. And all those who were already in the other modules, they learned that already. So if possible, you should perform a standard procedure every time. This is what we said. And now I have a question for you. Um, and you can, can vote if, uh, which procedure you would perform if the tumor is at the right flexure, if the tumor is at the left flexure, or if the tumor is in the mid transverse colon. And, and I would ask Maite to put up the questions that we have an overview who is doing what. So the first question will be for the right flexure, which procedure would you perform? And you can please vote now. And then we go to the next question, which procedure you would perform if the tumor is in the left flexure? You will have the same answer possibilities as for the right flexure. I hope that a lot of people are, are voting, even if you're a resident or very experienced, just consider what would you do if it's the right flexure, the tumor is exactly located there. So the next question is the left flexure. Can we see that? And not the result, please. Yeah. Okay. Also can vote, please. The results will be shown later on. And then consider which procedure you would perform if the tumor is in the mid transverse colon. Of course, pretty nice mark that you find it. Okay. So these are my three questions to you. If everybody has answered, I will proceed. Because the one thing you really have to take out of this lecture is that this is the most difficult laparoscopic procedure you can do on a colon resection. Of course, rectal resections are another thing, but in the colon, 
the transverse colon is the most difficult procedure you can estimate. And this is why it's mainly excluded from large scale trials. And on the other hand, it's a low number because only 10% of the colorectal cancer is in the transverse colon. So we do not have enough cases to, to train and, and to learn how to do that, but that's true for open and for laparoscopic surgery as well. So this is one of the most difficult procedures if you're not cut out just one little piece. And why is it difficult? What is the difficulties? It's the overview, that's the first thing. And we had already the question, how do you avoid the bowel always running into your, your midline, always covering all the, the nice structures and, and you run in the problem that with your instruments, maybe you, you always touch the bowel and, and you damage maybe the bowel. So it's a difficult overview. And there are some tricks like using the swaps, like positioning, like, like keeping all your options often where you will position yourself. I will come to that later, but this is one of the points. But the main reason is the anatomical hazards. So we know that there is a high variety and fragility of vessels, especially of the veins. So if you cut them, you run into a bleeding and that causes the problems. The mesenteric root of the transverse colon is very close and we saw that before, mainly attached to the pancreas and also to the vessel origin. So you want to cut some vessels, but you want to preserve the others. If you cut the very um, high uh, jejunal arteries, if you want to, to make the transverse colon resection, you will, you will harm the patient and run in a big problem. For example, this was one publication of the group of Hohenberger and Stelzner, and they showed that uh, there are some aberrant, also lymphatic, but the venous drainage is, is very variable and closely related to the pancreatic and mental veins. So you can run into some troublesome bleedings during your surgery. And of course, in a transverse colon resection, you always have to be very close there. You don't just cut only one of the branches of the mid colic artery but you have mainly to take it centrally and then you're really on the pancreatic head. There's another uh, work in 2019 of the D3 lymph node dissection for patients with advanced transverse colon cancer. And you see that very nice, that similar as the picture was shown by Colin. Now we, here we have the pancreatic head and the, the processes here. You see the, the big vessels we want to preserve and only those who really go to the colon and it's it's very difficult you you have to run along this line so you stay very close to the pancreatic head you have all the lymph nodes you want to take with you to take a, a proper to make a proper uh, complete mesocolic excision and and this is one one example um, of, of this study showing that the variability also from the mid colic artery it's not what we think that we have those nice two branches sometimes you have two origins of the mid colic artery uh, sometimes you have them from different sides and the left colic is also connected here to the left part and you have another uh, two, uh, like you think this is a type A, but the type C has another left one and the, the, that's also possible. You have even three of them. So maybe you, you can, of course, do a 3D reconstruction from your CT scan before, but you have to be aware that there is a high variety and not only on the arteries, but also on the veins. And th that also means that if there is a tumor, you can have a possible contact from the tumor to the mesenteric root, to the vessels, or even involvement of the pancreas, spleen, stomach, gallbladder, liver. All what is in, in close to the, to the um, transverse colon can be attached and also involved by the tumor. And that makes it much more difficult. And we will come to that maybe when we talk about T4 tumor resections, uh, if this is laparoscopic possible or not. And then, of course, many people did not dare to do laparoscopic approach. And it was even in, in some countries or some hospitals, they, they, it was forbidden to do that and they did not want uh, to do that. And as we do not have them in the large trials, we have to look for other uh, literature. And you see there is one from two years ago, laparoscopic versus open approach. And they said that laparoscopy, it was 11 uh, trials put together with 1,400 people. Um, 652 open versus 760 laparoscopic. And you see there were extended right, left, and transverse colectomies. They were all put together. And this was the, the main topic was the laparoscopy is longer or our time, but they stay shorter. But oncologically, 
they uh, are equivalent. There were also a few subtotals. I put that in the last because it's only a, a few number, but you see even that is more than only one option. So it looks uh, in the in the short and long time outcome, it looks equivalent oncological. And that's very important, but they say we need high quality randomized controlled trials. If it's, as it's only 10%, this will not be easy to do a randomized controlled trial with a high number of patients in. So maybe we, we wait much longer and look for registries. And this is similar like in Denmark for, for the year 2010 to 2013, they were looking on 300 and 60 transverse colon cancer, mainly done open, 25% were done laparoscopic, and also there were extended right and extended left, and also transverse colectomy. So even we think we do always the same procedure, and, and if we think we know what to do, it's, it's not quite clear what we should do. Um, there were 6.4% leaks, um, and there were no, differ uh, no difference. Uh, the 30 day mortality was rather high, I think, with 5.9%. The recurrence is up to 13%, and this was median of the 1.1 year. And this is what is always estimated that transverse colon cancer has a worse outcome. And maybe that that's, was thought to be related to the kind of surgery we do, and, and we can also make surgery better for the transverse colon, especially for the lymphadenectomy. The three-year overall survival in this group was 77%. This is obviously the, the largest we, we have from uh, a registry for the moment, and, and we're looking forward to have some others. And what they found out that especially if a non-mesocolic resection, so non-complete mesocolic resection, this was the strongest predictor for a recurrence. Um, even when it was a little bit lower in the laparoscopic group, the, sim the, the, the similar long-term results showed that uh, laparoscopy is also possible. But this indicates a little bit that the, the major point where we as the surgeons can do something, we can learn and we can perform a proper mesocolic uh, resection. This was also done for the robot and I only uh, showed these to show you that there were also right, left, extended, subtotal colectomy, even a total colectomy. And what I wonder is that there was a rather high intraoperative complication rate which also indicates this is the, the most difficult procedure we, we can, can offer in laparoscopic colorectal surgery. And probably the, the robot has there, it's, it's best uh, to do um, and, and best to be uh, used for, for difficult lymphadenectomy and high verbal uh, vessels. There the robot maybe really brings uh, a big advantage for the surgeons and then also for the patient. Um, I, I, I really consider that. So that's the one part of difficulties. But then we also have to talk a little bit, and this was not touched already now for the lymphatic drainage and also the extents, because you saw we had some, some different uh, answers. And, and if I come back now to, to what I asked you, what we should do with the right flexure, so maybe we can have now the answer. What are you as a group of, of uh, more than 200 people what are you thinking to do if the tumor is on the right flexure? And Maite, can you show us please the result, what, what the audience is doing for the a tumor at the right flexure and will we see if it's only one procedure? Can we have the result? Okay, you see mainly it's done of course on the right side, but two third is doing an extended right and one third is doing only uh, a right. Of course, I hope nobody is doing a left, even if there is a 1%. If, if you can do an extended left, that could be an option, but the left uh, does not touch the right flexure. So I hope nobody is doing uh, a left colectomy for that. So let's go for the left flexure. What, what is the audience doing in a left flexure two more? Can you show the result? Okay, you see the variety it is a bit, little bit higher. I hope nobody does it right because it does not touch the left flex. You can do it extended right, that's true. It's only 13%. There is only 3% doing transverse colon. Mainly it's done extended left or left colectomy, but even 5% is doing a subtotal. So you see, these are all options which obvious are possible. The right, of course, is not possible. Maybe that's just a test if it works. And the last one is if you have a mid transverse colon uh, tumor. So what is the audience doing? Let's have a look on that. Okay, you see there's also 
the group of transverse colon resections is a little bit higher, but it's it's not half of them, and the subtotal colectomy is a little bit uh, pricing. Mainly, it's extended. And this, if you go to the literature, actually, this is the most discussion, which of those two or are those similar, which of those we should do uh, the extended right or not. And I, I want to remind you on the surgical anatomy, and you always have to have this in focus. So this is the mid-cut supply, everything which is green on this side. So it's really the right side up to the middle of the transverse colon. This is mid-gut supply, everything from the superior mesenteric artery. And if we go to the other side, it's by the hind gut coming from the inferior. And also the lymphatic drainage is like this. So if you imagine there is a cancer in the left flexure, so you have to estimate as they are linked together, you will have both. So of course, you will have to take the artery in its, uh, at its origin here, the mid colic, and you have to take the left. You don't have to take the inferior uh, mesenteric artery, and that's also true for the vein. So if you have a splenic flexure tumor, it's not obvious. It's not necessary to take the whole um, vein, uh, inferior mesenteric vein. It's, it's uh, necessary to take the left branch, the left colic vein, and the left colic artery, and the same on the right side. But if, if, if we have the extents, there are some guidelines, and this is, for example, the German. It's clear if you have the tumor here, that's not right or transverse. It's clear what you have to do and you have to take the right branch. But we are talking about these tumors, for example, the right uh, or the transverse colon. And then it's a little bit uh, another way and where it's clear you always have to take the, the central part of the mid colic artery and also the veins coming here. You have to take them all, but even more. Uh, it was shown in, the, uh, in, in some, some uh, uh, literature, I will show you later on, that the lymphogen metastasis is also along the, the omentum towards the stomach and also the resection of the gastroepiploic arcade and the prepancreatic lymph nodes is necessary. This is uh, same in the, in the German guideline. So you have to resect the omentum, you have to resect the gastroepiploic arcade and not only as it was shown before, the flexion mobilization without uh, the omentum and the arcade. So maybe the, and this is newer because five years ago it was not in the in the guideline, but now it's in the German guideline. I don't know if you use uh, in your country you have other guidelines, but this was interesting. Um, um, and and uh, there is the, the literature done in between showed that this makes makes sense. Um, this is now how should we go for transverse or for extensive colectomy? Um, and they, they put together 12,000, nearly 12,000, uh, and this is open-end laparoscopy, but it, it does not mean that, that the strategy we use is, is different. And they, they came uh, that both is, is feasible and it's, it's not necessary to make an extended right or left. You can also stay with the transverse if it's a mid, really a mid uh, transverse colon cancer. And, and the same is in, in another study. If you have a mid-transverse colon cancer, both the extensive right or the transverse is, is possible, but it may be a little bit the laparoscopic extended right interested in this study showed maybe with fewer postoperative complications due to the um, anastomotic leakage we have between the ileal uh, descending uh, and easier anastomosis, obvious than colonic uh, anastomosis. And then in this paper also, it is a little bit shown what is about the lymphatic drainage. And you see that D1, D2, and D3, and this is from the Japanese society. So you, you want to impress something, you know now this, we are talking about the lymph node station number 223. This is the very central one. If we do have them with us, or if we only stick to 21 and 22. So this is number 23, and we should have them with us if we do the transverse colon resection. Of course, it's done with the CME, but not only, there is another work from the group of Hohenberger, which considered that there is extra mesocolic lymph node stations and they are relating to the infrapancreatic, so infrapancreatic lymph nodes and also the gastroepiploic. And this especially came in now in the guideline to the, the need to resect the gastroepiploic arcade because there were lymph nodes, and you see it was 11% of the infra, infra pancreatic and also 9% of the gastroepiploic, meaning around 20% of the 
uh, patients with positive lymph nodes had also positive lymph nodes here. The question is, does it add something or do they need anyway a chemotherapy because then surgery does not help alone? But nevertheless, they showed already that there were lymph nodes and now the guidelines say you should do that. On the other hand, you see that the postoperative complication rate and the mortality is uh, not that low. Even this is only 45 patients, so maybe we, we have to really good train and it's not a beginner's, it's really the most complicated and the most difficult operation we can do. You have to, to make both lectures, you have to keep all your options open, so be prepared to stand here as a surgeon, but also here and also here, you have to be able to walk around. The question is also which trocar placements you use, so this is the one chance you can do that like a diamond. Of course, you can have other possibilities, but sometimes you have to go really low, so this could be a good option if you start here, the camera in the middle, you can also go with the camera here and use these two. You can put the camera here, so keep all options open. And also, if your instruments are too small, this was one question, maybe you have to put another choker here for the flexure or use longer instruments. Normally, the standard instruments are enough if a patient is not um, too, um, um, the PMI is too high, and then you maybe have to make another row of trokers very close to the ribs to be able to reach the flexure. Um, so this is the operative strategy, and this was similar as we were used to the left and, and right side. The only thing you should approach from medial lateral, and as you saw before from posterior, but also I advise to come maybe from anterior for the gastroepiploic arcade. The vessels maybe you should do really at last and not in the beginning as we do in other procedures, because there it could, you could really harm, and then you have more space to secure them and to keep uh, them pretty new. nice. Of course, always you have to reset the momentum as a, and as I told you, the gastroepiploic card. And this is just to show you, please use a swab. If you, if you pull up something, you see here, this is the duodenum. Don't grab into the mesocolon because you will rupture it and really touch very gently and, and try not to, to rupture. You see here, this is Tolls fascia, very, very uh, thin. So don't rupture as if possible. And then there is another one to show you if you can come from above, uh, also uh, coming from above and really have a nice view on your vessels. Uh, you see, this is the stomach here, the duodenum. We resected the arcade already, and now we are coming because we just freed that. Here is pancreas already. We just freed the veins and want to stay very close. So don't rupture it, and sometimes it's easier to come from above than from below, but use all options and really do the vessels in the end to have enough space to control then perfect. Okay, let's proceed here. The last rules I showed you, love the vessels, control them safe, and in the end, be sure that the anastomosis, and if you need a stoma, which is rarely done here, these are also major crucial steps for the patient, so make time, team time out before you do the anastomosis, take your time to make a safe anastomosis that really makes sense, and don't rush out of the operation before you made a last overview. So now I, I will hand over to Friedrich Herbst and it's really a pleasure and honor to have him in the expert panel um, and he is really a very skilled laparoscopic colorectal surgeon. I learned a lot of him and thanks Friedrich to join us and he will talk about total and subtotal colectomies. My topic, um, the topic I was given is uh, I think um, um, also fairly complex. Uh, you've heard already about left, right, plus um, uh, transverse, and I'm not gonna, going to talk about the rectum only in, in this talk. What I thought is that um, I start off with um, um, some definitions um, to set the scene and then um, focus on uh, indications and uh, tactical steps that I uh, find important there. Obviously, um, in the American literature, uh, it's usually called a total abdominal colectomy, which uh, means that you take everything away except for the rectum. And then the question is how much of the rectum, because the rectum is anatomically ill-defined, as you would, as I would say, because the anatomical de uh, definition is different from the surgical. And usually we say where the uh, tinea fan out, there's the... Um, the rectosigmoid junction, but that can be very low down. 
So usually people um, divide the rectum at the, the level of the promontory, which in some patients will mean um, having sigmoid uh, retained there. And uh, a subtotal colectomy either um, leaves more sigmoid in or in, uh, for example, functional surgery can leave also the cecum for a cecal rectal and that's the most if you want to preserve the uh, ileocolic, uh, the uh, ileocecal valve. And obviously proctocolectomy as such is, uh, means taking everything out with or without the, the anal sphincters. And then the question is, what do you do afterwards? And for the, uh, for the abdominal colectomy, you end up either with a stoma uh, and a, re a rectal stump that's closed or an anastomosis. And in the proctocolectomy, depending on um, indications, obviously you uh, will do uh, an ileoanal pouch operation, or you take out the uh, uh, the, the rectum, uh, the the pelvic floor, and sphincter if it's oncologically necessary, or in benign disease you can do an intersphincteric excision. Um, and then there's the situation that, especially in um, ill patients, you can't do everything in one step. Um, so you do the colectomy and the, uh, with an ileostomy first and you end up doing completion proctectomies, either restorative type or ablative type. And all these uh, options you can have um, both in elective and uh, emergency situation. Now, when we look at what um, uh, indications uh, they have for doing uh, elective total colectomy, and that's the uh, data from the States, a little bit old, but uh, nevertheless, it's, um, I think it's not so much different now. Uh, that's a national inpatient sample uh, of those um, four years. And you see that about two thirds of these operations are done openly um, at, at that time, and uh, almost 40% laparoscopic, and it's mainly uh, ulcerative colitis and cancer. And if you take Crohn's together um, and um, in the benign tumors that's usually genetic um, disease, then about 70% of all those uh, colectomies are done for these indications. And so because that's uh, most frequent, um, and sorry, what you see is that uh, you see all these effects of uh, laparoscopic uh, surgery, uh, and that's also true for the, uh, for the biggest operations, um, you, you have a shorter length of stay, it's a little bit more expensive, uh, and uh, you have less morbidity and mortality if you do it uh, laparoscopically. Um, the, the number of robotic cases in there is fa fairly small, only about 300. So um, in that particular data set, uh, we can't talk about that very much. Now, uh, it's, even in, uh, in the mainly physician's world of, um, uh, if, uh, of IBD, it's now accepted that for the, for the elective surgical treatment of uh, UC, um, laparoscopic surgery um, is, um, is, is uh, indicated if you have the setup to do that. Um, and I think there's um, in uh, not only reduced um, uh, adhesion formation, which especially in proctocolectomy is a big problem because the uh, people get about um, uh, bowel obstruction in about 30% of cases, and most of these would be uh, treated conservatively, but a uh, sizable proportion over time will need repetitive surgery. And especially in women, um, there is um, fecundity is uh, better preserved than if you do an open. Uh, pelvic dissection. And there's an additional aspect and that's been shown by Willem Bengelmann's group from Amsterdam um, that um, especially women and that's a lot of people in the IVD world, um, if you can do an operation uh, using the laparoscopic technique, they, they, uh, they will have superior body image and, um, and because because you have a lot more risk 
to, uh, to open the bowel, to uh, contaminate the abdominal cavity. Um, if, if you can do that safely, this, this will um, uh, produce the same um, advantages uh, than in the elective uh, situation. Now, when uh, obviously there's a, there are various ways of uh, doing uh, a proctocolectomy uh, or a total colectomy. And the question is, um, you know, um, how robust are data there? And one has to say that there is um, very little uh, data and especially no formal comparative studies uh, that compare the various uh, accesses. And you can do a single incision, you can do reduced port, um, but most of these cases will be done uh, in, in multi-port uh, technique. And there are some situations where it's very attractive to use a transanal uh, approach, but that's in the, in the very early phase of um, uh, clinical practice. And uh, to stress again, unfortunately, we don't have any robust data um, that will tell us which um, situations are best dealt with, with those various um, situations. And then the question is, and that's mainly true for the, the benign situation, how should we deal with the mesentery? Uh, in the previous presentations, um, you've been shown mainly cancer operations, obviously, where you need central um, vessels and adequate lymphadenectomy. But in benign disease, um, so if you don't have cancer or dysplasia, for example, in UC or in polyposis, you can do uh, some type of tubular resection. Um, and the question is, uh, why would you do that? And some of the answers are shown here. Uh, you get a lesser dissection with a small, uh, smaller wound area and hopefully minimize um, especially autonomic nerve injury, which in benign disease um, like colitis can be a big issue um, because it's usually younger people and men don't like to be rendered impotent, obviously by surgery, which is a, um, a well-known hazard of pelvic and uh, low pelvic dissection anyway. And if you do an ablative procedure, um, a, uh, a close rectal or perimuscular dissection will reduce risk of uh, perineal uh, wound, healing dis wound healing disturbances. And uh, the question only is, is this also true in, in the data? But before we get to the data, I'll just show you a short uh, clip there. And, um, you know, I would, the question where, what do you call a tubular resection? is not so easy. I usually call it a convenience division uh, because especially in Crohn's and in many cases with uh, bad uh, inflammation, a real tubular resection is very messy and uh, you get a high risk of um, opening the bowel and uh, get, get fecal spillage. So I tend to um, do uh, a compromise dissection, which uh, usually goes around the mid uh, length of the mesentery, where you can be sure that uh, there's no particular risk of uh, other vital structures, but on the other hand, um, have a shorter length um, of division line. Now, um, when we turn to rectal dissection, as a part of proctocolectomy. Now in, uh, in UC, obviously everybody that has high grade dysplasia or cancer in either the colon or the rectum will need a complete oncologic clearance from the pelvic floor up to the, um, to the ileum. Um, and um, so I think it's, it's no good idea to say, well, you know, the dysplasia is in the transverse, so we can do a tubular resection of the rectum because you get multiple um, synchronous tumors um, and there's a, to diagnose that very often. And even 
um, and if you don't have dysplasia or cancer of the rectum, then you can do um, a, um, I see that my internet connection is not so stable, perhaps if you can tell me if I need to repeat something. Anyway, the uh, denovius fascia is, um, uh, if you want to, to, uh, to do a close rectal dissection, is um, left in the patient to minimize neurogenital complications. And this has um, been in, uh, in operation for a long time. Uh, Emmanuel Lee in Oxford developed that concept. And in the old times, when there was only diathermic dissection, this was quite cumbersome. Um, and nowadays, with uh, all the modern advanced uh, uh, dissecting devices, it's uh, greatly facilitated. And what you do is you reduce uh, dead space in the pelvis. And the only question is, is the, uh, is the data showing what the concept thinks? And um, there is um, a Dutch study that's, uh, that's looked at that. And it, if you do a, a close rectal dissection, it takes you about half an hour longer and you create fewer complications. But on the other hand, the, uh, the quality of life uh, and also sexual function aspect um, at one year is no different. So you get a short-term benefit. And there's another study that's looked at that um, in only male uh, patients. And um, unfortunately, there is no difference in uh, impotence rates in younger people uh, and no ejaculation disorder in any of those patients. So obviously that's a complex issue um, complex, also vascular pelvic uh, issue that's, uh, that can't only be boiled down to the question whether mesentery stays in place or not. But if you want to give the patient the best chance, obviously a perimuscular dissection um, can be a good idea. And I, I will show you a minute of video. And what you usually do is you uh, preserve the superior rectal artery. Um, and you can see it pumping um, uh, the left lower border and then um, divide the peritoneum. And um, it's especially in, in the frail inflamed mesentery, it's very important not to take too much. If it's soft, that's all right. But especially it's important to divide the peritoneum uh, separately because um, the uh, uh, the uh, machinery can get difficulty in calculating the appropriate um, energy that's there and you can get bleeding. If you get down to the Douglas area, uh, stay on the rectum um, and um, divide the peritoneum here because then you can get in uh, the Is, um, the, the thickness of the, meson, the, the mesorectum gets diminished. And so there's, in many um, slim patients, there's not a lot of difference in terms of uh, total mesorectal excision or uh, tubular resection because in the low rectum, there's not much of mesentery anyway. Especially in benign cases, it's very important not to get your stapler if you do a restorative procedure too low down and use your finger. Um, and even when you've placed your stapler, use your finger again, uh, because it's easy to resect uh, the internal anal sphincter as well. Now in non-restorative procedures, um, the, uh, the situation has turned out to be different. It's always been held that uh, you get reduced mobility if you do a close rectal um, dissection. But as you may know, uh, in, in Crohn's, um, there are data to show that uh, the mesentery has an immunological um, capacity and leaving a lot of inflamed mesentery in may uh, increase uh, Crohn's um, relapse rate. And that's also true, um, obviously, in, um, if you take out a Crohn's rectum. Uh, this, this particular study shows that there is, is an older study, shows that there is less um, 
problem if you do a perimuscular dissection. But um, this is a recent uh, Dutch study that's looked at that um, and uh, that has shown that patients who have a retained mesorectum have actually more problems and lower healing rates. And the therapy for uh, these patients actually has been to go back in, take out the remaining uh, mesorectum, and then uh, in a lot of those patients, healing was um, achieved. So I think it's important to make a distinction of what kind of indication you have, and probably um, the current situation would be that in Crohn's, uh, it's um, better to, to do a, a formal mesorectal excision. Now, in a lot of benign surgery, obviously there's no need to take out the omentum unless um, this is an acute um, operation and you may have seat perforations because if you open that and contaminate the pelvic cavity, you get a lot of infection problem and uh, that's an important thing to, uh, to avoid. And um, Collins talked about that in benign disease. It's, um, I think it's a, a very good idea to preserve the uh, phrenicocolic ligament because it will prevent you from tearing um, uh, the spleen and necessitating any surgery there. The question then is now we've, we've dissected out everything. So where do we take out, this, uh, take out the specimen? And obviously you all know about those various sites and um, many people, if they don't do a natural orifice, um, extraction or, or the anal area in a non-restorative procedure, we'll use a fan and steel um, uh, incision. Uh, the only problem uh, if you do a pouch in obese people is that, that you either need a very large fan and steel incision or you will not be able to do that uh, well under vision. So um, when it comes to reconstruction pouches, uh, um, is an important concept and uh, most people will do a J pouch um, and uh, only if you don't get length, uh, enough length, you will need an S pouch and it's important, um, the, the old discussion about stapled or manual ileoanal anastomosis I think has been settled and the mucosectomy and hands-on anastomosis only is necessary if you get low rectal dysplasia or some of those risk factors. Uh, shown here. In the pouch surgery, there's also a problem I think that leads to the next presentation is a problem of reach in many cases and ways of dealing with that is one, do a trial descent when you've taken out the rectum if you get down there. Um, you need maximum mesenteric root mobilization um, and then you can do those step ladder incisions and also do some selective vascular divisions. Diversion is a hotly debated topic there um, and uh, there are newer concepts with aggressive uh, doing uh, a modified two-stage operation where the pouch is done without a stoma and if there's a leak, go in early and aggressive and use a secondary stoma and endosponge treatment. And that's, um, um, that's uh, an interesting concept and there's some data to support that but I think it's, um, uh, it's only applicable if you do a lot of pouches. If you do only a few of those, like most people, it's usually safer to, to use a stoma. So um, to, to, to sum up what I've been trying to say, what's, what's my take on that? I do those operations uh, using a multipod technique and combine that with transanal dissection for a complete completion protectomy and in non-restorative cases, obviously I usually use phenostyl or the stoma site and um, in restorative cases at, uh, in women I offer the transvaginal extraction, but you can't do a pouch transvaginally. Um, I, I, in the benign cases, uh, I'll pre preserve the omentum and phrenicocolic ligament. The mesenteric uh, the extensive mesenteric uh, resection will depend on indication and uh, in benign cases, close rectal dissection uh, is applicable. My sequencing is I will start on the, on the left side from mid-transverse 
to the uh, uh, upper pelvis, then turn to the right, uh, put the uh, specimen of the division of the ileum into the left upper abdomen, and then do uh, the rectal resection without having problems with uh, ileum uh, obstructing the view. And I, I actually, I'm a, uh, an ostomist. I will do diverting stomas in, the, uh, in these anal or very low anastomosis in virtually all cases. Thank you very much for your attention. And we just move ahead due to time reasons already for Michael Petiriat. And I thank you for joining us. And we have some cases and gaining length, question of gaining length in laparoscopic colorectal surgery. Please. I'm going to tell you a few words about how to gain length after left-sided colonic resections, because I think it's much more difficult than after right-sided. In right-sided, uh, we just need to have mobile small bowel, and in the left-sided colonic resection, it is particularly difficult. And therefore, uh, flanic, splenic fracture mobilization is considered very difficult. Uh, in terms of difficulty in laparoscopic surgery. Of course, there are more difficult operations, but they also require splenic flexure mobilization. And the situation becomes very, very difficult uh, in situation uh, you can see here, either in the case of extended left colectomy, when you take the middle colic vessels, or in case of left colectomy and total mesorectal excision. For instance, in like in, uh, uh, synchronous cancer, uh, which can happen sometimes. Uh, of course, there are easy solutions for that, uh, which are convenient for a surgeon and hard to accept for the patient. Uh, I mean, iliorectal anastomosis, which is an option, uh, meaning also the subtotal or, or total colectomy, or permanent colostomy, uh, which is unacceptable for the patient in most cases. Uh, of course, there are situations in which we must do this, but there are many uh, other alternatives you can uh, consider during surgery. One of them is the lawyer's procedure. Uh, it is relatively old uh, alternative, uh, more than 50 years old. Uh, and uh, it isn't performed uh, very often. Therefore, I will want to show you my video. Uh, the case presents a relatively old female patient uh, with uh, colorectal adenocarcinoma in the sigmoid colon and additional large adenoma in the transverse colon. Uh, so the patient requires uh, extended left colectomy. Uh, and what you can see here, uh, preoperatively, we, uh, we put tattoo to, to localize the tumors uh, during surgery. Uh, I'm not going to show you the entire left uh, and left resection, left splenic flexure mobilization. It has been shown previously. Uh, we also prefer medial to lateral approach. Uh, so the, the spending collection has been mobilized. Now we dissect the transverse column from the, uh, from, uh, from the omentum. We enter the uh, omental bursa. Uh, and this is relatively easy. Uh, the patient is quite skinny, so it was quite easy. Now you can see that we are transecting the gastrocolic uh, ligament, uh, we are just mobilizing the transverse colon. We are moving forward and you can see middle colic vessels here and they will be taken later. Uh, and we, we continue with uh, right uh, flexure mobilization. Uh, in this case, this was easier from, from the top, uh, mostly due to the location of the port. Uh, ports we we used uh, in this case the, it was typical port placement for left colonic resection and we continue uh, farther we need to mobilize the entire uh, right colon up to the uh, up to the cecum you could see the um, the appendix showing somewhere there and now we change the 
camera to the lower port and we continue with the section of the transverse colon mesentery. Uh, here you can see triads ligament and yeah and uh, the most of the procedure has been done previously I mean the uh, flexure mobilization but there is still uh, there is still uh, inferior mesenteric vein to be dissected uh, and now we are entering the the mental uh, bursa we take the IMV uh, so for, for some reasons I always try to clip the larger vessels no matter if it's a vein or or if it's, if it's an artery. And here you can see middle colics, uh, which also have to be uh, taken. Uh, and we continue further. This, at this time the procedure becomes quite difficult because the specimen is quite floppy. Uh, and uh, manipulation of with the specimen becomes really annoying sometimes, especially if the bowel is distended. Uh, but in this case, it was quite quite easy. Now we are opening the the mesentery uh, from below. This is the place where the mesentery is very very thin, and the last bite uh, is here, and so the the mesentery is fully mobilized. Uh, we have to find a place to transect the bowel. Uh, it will be done after, after a mini laparotomy. I just mark the place where the bowel will be transected and uh, finish the transection uh, of the mesentery. Uh, usually you can see that the bowel changes the color so uh, you, you can see where it is devascularized. Of course, ICG can be very helpful. And now comes the case. Uh, you have to rotate the uh, right colon, which is fully mobilized, uh, counterclockwise. Uh, the last part is to mobilize the, col uh, the, the cecum from below. And there are always some adhesions. One has to be uh, quite uh, careful because uh, of course, this is the place where uh, the ureter comes to uh, to view. But of course, if you are close to the bowel in the proper layer, you won't damage the ureter. And now, it now we, you can see uh, the uh, operative field after removal of the specimen. Only ileocecal vessels are are left, uh, and we will try to rotate the bowel. You can see the ileum, the cecum, the anvil, and counterclockwise rotation of the bowel. Uh, the bowel is fully mobilized. The patient was quite skinny, so the anatomy was very pleasant. Uh, and you can see, I know it looks very twisted and it can be annoying, but, uh, but it works very well. Uh, the anastomosis is completely tension free. Uh, so uh, there is enough uh, length uh, and of course uh, no tension. So this is one option you can use. Uh, of course you can move the bowel into the pelvis if, if it's needed. Uh, in original Deloitte's procedure uh, appendectomy is, uh, is done we decided not to remove the appendix. The patient was 78. We thought that perhaps she won't develop appendicitis in the future. And besides, we put the, uh, the, 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 the cecum in the place with it, with it, with, where it usually uh, is. So uh, we weren't afraid of abnormal symptoms of appendicitis somewhere in the upper right quadrant or something like this. Uh, an alternative for those who don't trust the twisted bowel is so-called uh, retroileal transmesenteric anastomosis. Uh, it is also a very attractive al alternative uh, and how it looks in this case. Uh, 
this was very difficult case for me. I had a patient uh, with uh, second uh, colorectal cancer, this time in the descending colon, and he was previously treated uh, in another department. Uh, he underwent uh, mm, total mesorectal excision and radiotherapy six years ago. Uh, and uh, one interesting thing, he was treated in another department and here you can see his inferior mesenteric artery with all the vessels uh, which haven't been taken previously. So the previous surgery wasn't very oncologically optimal. Uh, so we decided to resect the inferior mesenteric artery and uh, proceed with the surgery further. And uh, the left part was done. Now we are, yeah, here you can see middle colics. So we dissect the uh, transverse colon on the right. We mobilize the right uh, hepatic flexure. Here you can see middle colics. You can see right uh, colic vein as well. And uh, of course, it was obvious that uh, they have to be taken to gain length. Uh, these are very, very short vessels. So I decided to take them. Uh, as I told you, I clip these vessels. Uh, despite ligature works perfectly, I, I prefer to sleep well. Uh, and this also requires a lot of mobilization. I would say it, it, there is no difference between the lawyers and this kind of uh, procedure, but uh, it goes quite smoothly usually. Uh, and you can see that we have and the specimen, uh, sorry, that's not the specimen, that's the bowel that will stay. I try to put it down there to the pelvis. Uh, you can see the pelvis is very, very, very far away and the bowel still requires some mobilization. Uh, and the small bowel is on the way. So you create a tunnel uh, in the mesentery between the ileocecal vessels and between the ileal vessels. You just find the root of the mesentery uh, and you need to create a tunnel. If you are uh, in the good place, uh, you can be sure that you won't damage the vessels. If you see the vessels during dissection, it means that you are probably too low. I prefer to use a hook because in this case, is uh, the hook is more uh, precise and besides I can I can see if I take a vessel or just the fat and uh, yeah and so it goes if you are in the proper place you just open the mesentery without damaging the vessels uh, the, in this case the opening had to be very uh, wide because the bowel was quite distended uh, so we we didn't, we didn't want to have any problems with uh, passing the bowel. This is from above. This is from the pelvic side uh, opening. And when we have the, uh, the window, we can pass the bowel through the window. Uh, this is relatively easy if it still too short, you can think of more mobilization of the right bowel um, up to the, the cecum if it's necessary. In this case, the, the uh, transection of the bowel, I mean, in the pelvis, it was very, very low. So I decided to uh, perform anal anastomosis hand soon. But you can see that I was able to gain enough length so that uh, it was tension free. I decided to, to put the, um, the function ileostomy in this case. Uh, in colloidal anastomosis, I always try to, uh, to defunction uh, the, the anastomosis. Uh, thank you very much. And I hope you have some questions for me. And I will start the discussion round now and, and immediately start with your cases. And there was one question, if you do delays procedure, and the question is, if you, are you getting a twisted ileum 
if you turn it that way around. The ilium can twist. I mean, it it twists, uh, but it doesn't uh, influence the the function of the ilium. Uh, if it's fully immobilized, uh, somehow it finds the way, and uh, somehow it, somehow it works. So I mean. We didn't do, uh, we haven't done many of these procedures, but we never had problems with, uh, uh, with ileus, with obstruction, with something like this. Uh, it's, it's amazing, but these people function very well, two, three stools per day. Uh, so I'm not afraid of twisting, as long as you t turn the bowel counterclockwise. Yeah, so I also think that if, if you do it counterclockwise, the only thing is you get the appendix maybe in the left upper quadrant. So do you do an appendicectomy always? Uh, in this case, we didn't do the, the appendectomy, but uh, I think uh, it's, it's reasonable, especially in, in younger patients, uh, when you expect they will live longer and they can develop appendicitis. Uh, so not to... Uh, have problems with diagnosis later, it's, it's reasonable. It doesn't add too much of uh, risk. Let me, let me add one question. Do you, do you ever close then the mesenteric gap if you do delay? Do you close something? Do you suture the peritoneum or do you just leave it as it is? Uh, we'll leave it as it is. We close the, mes uh, the mesenteric defect after right colectomies, only after right colectomies. Okay, okay. Then maybe I would switch to Colin because there were some questions for you. Um, which, which port positions do you prefer if, if you go for splenic flexure mobilization for right uh, flexure mobilization and where do you position yourself? For the splenic flexure I use most of the time four trocars uh, like a left colectomy. The, the camera is with the umbilicus and then to uh, a 10 millimeter at the uh, right lower and, and, and a five a little bit higher. And I always do a, a five millimeter at the left side. And then uh, for the right collect me, most of the times I prefer three throw cars a little bit from below. So the camera is at the umbilicus and then um, the, the, the five is at the pubic. So from below and then the, 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 the 10 is, uh, a little bit uh, in the lower left quadrant. And what if your instruments are not long enough? What would you do? Uh, then you can always put an extra five. I mean, it, it, you shouldn't struggle. I mean, five millimeter trocar is not a problem. So you can, for a right, for example, you can always put in, in the midline a little bit higher an, an extra five or, or in the left, or in the, coming from the left. So it's, it's uh, I, I put an extra trocar. Okay. And then there is a question maybe which, which covers all three of you and I start with Colin. If, if you do a, a rectal sigmoid resection or rectal resection, what do you think, how often do you need the splenic flexure mobilized? In male patients, uh, always, uh, and always is, is, is in 95%. In female patients, sometimes uh, they have a, somehow have an anatomic longer sigmoid loop. Uh, specifically elderly patients, uh, and then, then uh, I don't mobilize the splenic flexure. But uh, in the majority of patients, I do mobilize it because I like a tension-free anastomosis at the end. So the majority yeah. we mobilize. Okay. Miguel, Miguel, how do you do that? What do you think? In, in how many uh, cases do you need the splenic flexure in, in left uh, rectum resection or sigmoid well, resection? Heron Apperian, who is a wonderful surgeon and, and great person uh, used to say that there are three risk factors for anastomotic leakage. It's tension, tension, and tension. So uh, we have shifted from selective splenic flexure mobilization to almost in all cases. And I think it's, it's very um, educational as well. I mean, uh, you, you get practice and, uh, and, in almost every case, we now mobilize the splenic flexure. It doesn't take too much time. It, for B9 and malignant disease as well, it's, it's the same, or do we differentiate that? Uh, well, I, well for, for B9 uh, cases, I try to preserve left colic artery uh, for malignant as well. But 
I start with this planning flexion mobilization right now. It's easier because you don't have to uh, fight with the bowels twice. I mean, uh, when you start with the pelvis and then try to mobilize the flexure, you tilt the patient again. Uh, so we start with a splenic flexure. We do 20 minutes splenic flexure mobilization. We usually start from the medial. And uh, yes, I, I, I encourage everybody in my department to do it uh, in every case. Yeah. Okay. Friedrich, what is your opinion? I'm, I'm very much with Colin. And you know me, I've, um, you know, I've um, grown up with open surgery and um, I took to starting with uh, flexion mobilization first because it reduced the risk of tearing a spleen uh, because towards the end of the case, if it's getting necessary, then uh, bad things uh, can happen. And I'm completely with Colin that uh, in men, it's um, virtually every time you need, I mean, you know, what's, what's a rectal resection? If it's for cancer, it's usually, um, if it's not a, a distal sigmoid, it requires a, 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 an anastomosis close to the pelvic floor. So um, I will do a flexion mobilization virtually 100% enough. Sometimes, um, you know, if the sigmoid looks long, I get tempted and um, when I don't mobilize the splenic flexure first, I'll do it later. And I hate myself because it's, as uh, mm. has been said by Michael, is much more difficult with the uh, shifting bowel then. So, and I think if you look at, um, I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it's coming through. If you look at, for example, um, the, the work that's, that's been uh, done in robotic uh, rectal surgery, it always starts uh, in a systematic fashion with taking down the splenic flexure, going uh, all these um, uh, systematic steps. And it, 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 I think the main um, thing is not only um, does it reduce the tension and helps you uh, with um, doing everything you can do for a safe anastomosis, um, but cutting down on variability in those complex operations helps you not to get too tired and not to start making silly mistakes. Okay, so I, I continue with you because there was a question. If you have done for a patient in the FAP, if you have a, a, a total proctocolectomy and then uh, pathology brings out that there is a cancer inside. So what do you do next? Or do you always run for an oncological resection? Um, so you mean the, uh, if I understand it correctly, this is a patient that uh, has uh, FAP and there was no dysplasia in the um, in in on the endoscopy because usually yeah. you, you you would do um, you know either you have minute polyps two three millimeters where it's extremely rare to have um, dysplasia it happens and you may not pick it up but on the other hand cancers in FAP um, are conspicuous it's it's not it's not very easy to miss that. Uh, if you do a proper colonoscopy. And, but it's, it's a difficult problem. If it's an advanced cancer, you should have seen that during the operation. And I advise everybody to open the specimen when it's, when it's come out, because then there's a time when you still can go back and do um, a mesenteric uh, cancer resection, so to say. Um, but I have not come across the problem, and I don't know if there's an easy solution to that, because it's, it would mean... Uh, for me, if it's really um, a low, low, as a grade three cancer, for example, I would open the patient, go back again after about six weeks and take every mesentery out. Uh, there's no proof that this will uh, change the prognosis of the patient, but um, I think it's everything you can do. Okay, perfect. Well, then there was one question for the standard procedure for transverse colon, because everybody knows how to do the left, everybody or many people know how to do standard right, but they don't have a standard protocol for the transverse colon resection. Um, actually, what I do is, as I told you, as standardized as possible. And so I, I put those things together. And the main thing is I try to really have both lectures and the vessels in the end. But nevertheless, it's, it's always the same procedure for me. So first it's patient positioning. I put the omentum up to see the transverse colon I come always from below first. I, normally I try to get the vessels first, but I don't cut them. 
So I just make the preparation um, and I make both flags just before. If you do extend it right, of course you will start from below. If you do extend it left, I also start from below, which you could start from above, but, but I, I just turn to the above side to open the lesser sack when I have done everything from below already. So um, there, there are not good, not many good descriptions. Um, there is some literature about that. You can find two or three. I, I found them in, in the, the last month uh, where they, they say this is the best way, but, but actually it really depends where the tumor is. Maybe to all three of you, if you have a mid transverse colon uh, tumor really in the middle. So do you start on the right or the left side from above or from below? I start with Friedrich now from back to the. Well, um, I think it depends. Uh, I'm sorry to say that. If um, I think the only data that's there is support uh, resecting the, mes the, the omentum if it's a T3 cancer. Um, if it's early cancer, then um, embryologically the omentum doesn't belong to the colon, so it's not necessary. If it's an advanced cancer in the mid-transverse, for me, it means taking out the complete momentum, including the gastroploic arcade from uh, right, including the, the origin there and, and the left. And I, I have to say, I find it, um, if, if one starts with that, um, positioning of the colon is, um, uh, is, is uh, facilitated, but I usually start from below. And there's the, uh, the, this two window, two pancreatic window description thing where you um, um, leave the, the section of the, uh, the middle colic centrally as the last step and you, you are already in the lesser sac and know where the pancreas is and you're just left with the central bit um, to be uh, not to harm the, the, the central supply. Yeah, but I will exactly. start from below. Okay, Colin, you too. Uh, start from, from below, below and leave the yeah. vessels for the end. Yeah, but I, 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 I prefer not to do a transfer sectomy. I, I'm, I'm the one who was, was clicking on the extended right. Uh, I think I've never done a transfer section in my life. Uh, so it's always extended right or left. So it's, um, uh, I have the feeling that uh, transverse section, that a small bowel heals better when connected to a, to a colon than a, a colon resection. Uh, uh, so I think uh, it, it gets less leakage if you do uh, an extended right. But that's no proof for that. Well, but, but that was, was in the Danish that it has less morbidity and it's only linked to the anastomotic leakage. Yeah. Michael, your, your opinion? I would also go for extended right colectomy, which means I would start from the from the cecum. I mean, from the from below. I would try not to cut the vessels, but uh, it is often very difficult, especially if you need to do CME. So yeah, from from the cecum up to the yeah. But if uh, if it's a transverse colon. That, that was would, one question I would also. Do I would do extended extend right, right, but, but you yes. have to cut the vessels at its origin. So the question yes. was, can we cut it one or two centimeters apart from that? The question is not the vessel. The question is the lymph nodes. I mean, no, I would do CME for that. I mean, yeah. I'm very convinced to do CME. So yeah. yeah. But to answer the question, which, which I got, if it's enough to cut the vessels one or two centimeter above the origin, and I say, well, it, it's not the vessel. The question is, if you take the lymph nodes up, you can cut wherever you want because the lymph node is the, is the most important thing. So you have to, to have the lymph nodes with you and then you can leave a little bit of stump, which is of course better than to cut just at the border of the pancreas to have it a little bit higher. But the, the main thing is you need the lymph node and this is station number 223, as I showed you. You could see, in my, vi one. Yeah, you yeah. Could see in my videos that I peel the vessels and take all the lymph nodes with the specimen. Yeah. Exactly, we, we all show that, perfect. There's a last question maybe for Friedrich. If you have an ideorectal anastomosis, are you doing a stoma additional or not? At which height? <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, uh, formally ileorectal is done to, to have a good functional or proper functional outcome, which means at least 12 centimeters of rectum and in that situation, um, I wouldn't do a stoma. Um, 
you know, there's never say never. I mean, there are patients, if you, the rare case where you do an early rectal in colitis uh, with some inflammation, and uh, when having done the anastomosis, you're not completely happy, then I'd add a stoma because it, it will reduce the mobility. But in general, um, if um, in, in benign uh, disease, uh, I've never done a stoma in, in the first operation unless for leakage. And uh, if it's for colitis, it's very rare to meet that. And there are sometimes uh, I would add a stoma. Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot. I think time is over. I, I, I thank all the participants and all the panel to be here. It, it was great with you. You find already that you can register for the next module and, and maybe uh, I will I will add that and, and, and show it to you already what is the next one. But you are allowed to register um, from now on, of course. You can see this was thanks again for the panel, Friedrich, Michael and Colin, of course. And this will be the next one, which is on Thursday 24th. And we will have principles of ICG and fluorescence images. And you can register now already. And you will get the link sent for the last webinar sessions and also again for the invitation for next week.